Literaturpalast Audiospur Geschichten aus Südosteuropa Präsentiert von Traduki Common Ground Ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu diesem Audioformat, in dem ich mich heute mit der bosnischen Schriftstellerin Leila Kalamujic unterhalten werde. Über Städte und Dörfer, Grenzen und Ausgegrenzte, Träume, Begehren und Sehnsüchte – und im Besonderen über ihren neuen Prosaband Denkt ihr die Stadt, der in der Übersetzung von Marie Alpermann im Ether Verlag erschienen ist. Die Vorstellung von Autoren und Buch erfolgt auf Deutsch. Unser Gespräch werden wir heute jedoch auf Englisch führen. Dies ist eine kleine Neuerung in diesem Podcast, vor einer Weile schon erprobt mit Lea Üppi. Es wird also auch in Zukunft immer mal wieder eine Folge auf Englisch geben, was natürlich damit zu tun hat, dass viele Gäste kein Deutsch sprechen. Ich hoffe, Sie bleiben mir gewogen und nun freue ich mich sehr, mit Lela Kalamujic zu sprechen, die sich zurzeit in Berlin aufhält. Lela, now I'm switching languages, which is a bit awkward, but because it's still new, but it's gonna be fine. I'm very, I'm very happy to have you as my guest today. Welcome to this podcast. Uh, thank you so much. I'm really happy to be your guest today. So. You're currently in Berlin and not, not for the first time. How do you like your, your stay? How is Berlin treating you? Yeah, it's really great. I'm here uh, for almost a month. Uh, this is my last week. I'm in LCB in Berlin, Literarische Colloquium Berlin. And I got this fellowship for one month. So I'm having really, really good time here. And this is my second time in LCB. A few years ago, before Corona, I was on one festival and I'm happy to be here again. We already talked about this festival when we, um, before the recording started. It's usually quite interesting looking who was part of this festival. I think the name was Queer East because it was, it was just a, a lot of great authors. Some of them are translated already, some are not. And it's quite fitting because Berlin is usually seen as this very vibrant, open and, and liberal place, not only in Germany, but also abroad. What is your connection to Berlin or Germany in, in general? Actually, that Queer East uh, festival was my first time here. Mm -hmm. But um, I know many people who live in Berlin and who are from my country or the countries from for, former Yugoslavia. So now when I came again, I met many of them. So somehow it's not so far away from a home. That's the, the, the impression I have here, you know. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned already you're a guest of the Literatius Colloquium. So how do you spend your days? I think you live right, you also live in the building, right? You live next yeah, to the yeah. Wannsee? Yeah, next to Wannsee. It's, they have really a big and beautiful building. And I think at this moment there are 10 writers here from different countries here. Together with me is also a colleague from Slovenia, Dusan Šarotar. Mm -hmm. He's a really great writer, and I think he's already been translated into German. So, uh, yeah, he's leaving tomorrow, and uh, I'm leaving at the end of the October. So, yeah, it's a really great place also to meet uh, some new people, authors from different countries. So, yeah, I think at the moment that we are here, uh, ten of us, something like that. And uh, what have you been working on in this time? I think you, you also had some readings in Germany, right? In Halle and in Berlin? Yeah, I had, I think, six or seven readings oh, wow. till okay. now. So it is my busiest residency ever. <laughs> because um, first I have reading in Berlin. It's about uh, just after my second book was translated. It was the end of September. After that, I've been with my translator, Maria Pelman. We were together in uh, Halle and Leipzig. Mm -hmm. And then I got back to Berlin and have two more readings. And uh, just a few days ago, we, I went to Cologne. And I had also there two readings. One was of, of, on a Slavistic department, and the other one was in one really, really nice club. So, yeah, many readings. <laughs> <laughs> And you're not only familiar with Berlin or other German cities. I was, I was a bit surprised reading your new book, Denkt ihr die Stadt, because Vienna, the place where I live, also plays an important part in one of your stories. So you, you also know Austria for a bit, right? 
Uh, yes, I also I was in um, Vienna. I think it was 2016, February and March. I've got the residency in um, Museums Quartier mm -hmm. next to Maria Hilferstrasse. And I was there for two months and then that's how that story <laughs> came mm -hmm. up. But also I was in Graz last year for two months. And I had some readings also. Uh, I was once in Klagenfurt, so yeah. I cannot say that I know well Austria, but I know some <laughs> cities and I've been there. Okay, so before we talk about your new book, um, I'd like to introduce you and your work briefly, and I'll switch to German again, so I'll be back. Zunächst also ein paar Worte über meine Gesprächspartnerin und ihre Arbeit, jetzt wieder auf Deutsch. Lella Kalamujic wurde 1980 in Sarajevo geboren und studierte eben dort Philosophie und Soziologie. Sie schreibt Essays und Rezensionen für verschiedene Zeitschriften und Online-Medien, hat bislang drei Prosabände veröffentlicht und schreibt zudem für das Theater eins ihrer Stücke mit dem schönen Titel »Die Menschenfresserin« oder »Wie ich meine Familie umbrachte«, war auch an einer deutschsprachigen Bühne zu sehen, und zwar 2018 am Deutschen Theater Berlin. Zwei ihrer Erzählbände sind auf Deutsch verfügbar, nennt mich Esteban von 2020 und nun ganz neu denkt ihr die Stadt vom Herbst 2022. Beide Titel wurden von Marie Alpermann aus dem Bosnischen übersetzt und erschienen im Berliner Eta Verlag. Lela Kalemujic gehört zu den wichtigsten bosnischen SchriftstellerInnen der jüngeren Generation und wurde für ihre Arbeit mit mehreren Preisen und Stipendien ausgezeichnet. Der Vorgänger des aktuellen Buchs, also ihr erster deutscher Band, nennt mich Esteban, wurde sehr begeistert von der deutschsprachigen Kritik und vom Publikum aufgenommen. Das ist ein autobiografisch grundierter Text. Das Buch setzt sich aus ganz unterschiedlich angelegten Erzählungen, Dramoletten, Prosa-Miniaturen zusammen, die jedoch eng miteinander verwoben sind und auch als ein fragmentarischer Roman gelesen werden können. Kalamujic setzt sich darin mit ihrer verstorbenen Mutter auseinander, mit ihrer Queerness, dem Bosnienkrieg, mit Verlust, Trauma und Depression. Denkt ihr, die Stadt ist erneut ein Prosaband und besteht aus 16 Erzählungen, in denen wir es, anders als im Folge, mit ganz unterschiedlichen Charakteren und Lebenswegen zu tun haben. Oft geht es dabei um randständige Figuren, queere Personen, Kranke, Menschen, die unter erschwerten Bedingungen ihr Geld verdienen müssen, Menschen, denen das Glück abhanden kommt. Wir begegnen beispielsweise einem Hutverkäufer, der durch den Krieg seine Arbeit in Dubrovnik aufgeben muss, GastarbeiterInnen in Wien, die in Mozart-Kostüm Konzertkarten verkaufen, zwei RentnerInnen, die sich durch einen Zufall durch ihre Hunde kennen und dann letztendlich lieben lernen. Wir begegnen einer alkoholkranken älteren Frau, die sich sehnsüchtig an ihre Jugendliebe erinnert. Zwei Freundinnen, die durch die Krebserkrankung der einen wieder zusammenfinden und queeren Beziehungen, die durch ein homophobes Umfeld zum Scheitern verurteilt sind und in die Brüche gehen. Jeder Text beschäftigt sich mit einem anderen Leben, einem anderen Schicksal. Dennoch wirkt das Buch wie aus einem Guss, wird zusammengehalten durch die zurückgenommene, nie auf Effekt setzende Sprache und einen melancholischen Grundton. Einzelne Motive und Themen tauchen immer wieder auf, werden erneut aufgegriffen und variiert. Gelebte und ungelebte Träume und Sehnsüchte, verpasste Chancen und ergriffene Gelegenheiten trotz allem. Leila, I'd like to start with a couple of general questions regarding the literary scene and book market in Bosnia. There is a lot of talk about diversity in Germany, not so much in Austria, about marginalized perspectives that have been ignored in the past about the writing of female, queer, BIPOC or migrant authors. And discussed is not only the visibility of authors, but also the diversity of literary institutions, juries, publishing houses that are still very male dominated. Can you tell us about the current discourse in Bosnia concerning these issues? First of all, I'll need to, to say that uh, literary scene in Bosnia is also connected or, or linked with the scene, literary scene in Croatia, Serbia, Montenegro. And yeah, there is this younger generation in all these 
countries and there are some changes in, into this um, dominant discourse because as you said uh, now we have many many new voices especially female voices mm -hmm. and also voices from the somehow we can say marginalized groups who are uh, writing and somehow taking their place on the literary scene. So I think the biggest change during past 10 years is that we have really, really strong uh, younger generation of female authors. So there are strong bonds also to authors and institutions from other countries that share your language. Yes, uh, I, I, I'm not so sure. Uh, can I say it, uh, that there is a, a strong link between institutions, but there is really strong link between uh, writers, especially female writers, in those countries. So yeah, and it's not very rare that authors from Bosnia also published their books in uh, Croatia and Serbia. And otherwise, it's the same thing with the Serbian authors in Bosnia and Croatia, also Croatian authors. So so yeah, th there is some kind of, um, I even can say, friendship and support between uh, inside the, the younger generation of writers. As a female writer, but also as an activist for the queer community, how is your work received in your home country by the media and by readers? I really can say that I, uh, uh, yeah, I started maybe 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was something new. Now we have really strong uh, voices from these um, female authors and the perspective from uh, queer people. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that uh, from the beginning, uh, the medias and the scene followed my work and that I didn't have many problems or any problems to work as a um, queer author. Yeah, mm -hmm. but you know, there is a distinction between literary scene and also uh, what's happening in the society. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we are talking about this literary scene, uh, I think somehow my work was recognized and also um, and was always publicly um, followed. So I didn't have any problems with that. Mm -hmm. Germany likes to see itself as a, a very open and, and liberal place. Recently, the German Book Prize uh, was awarded to a non-binary author, Kim de Lorison. Maybe you heard about their book, uh, Blutbuch. I just came back from, from Frankfurt, there was, so there was a lot of talk about the situation there. The, the, the book received a lot of praise, but lots of, also lots of hatred, especially on, on social media and during the fair. Uh, the author needed to be protected by the police. So, so here we have this divide between the literary scene and, well, how do you, how do you put this? Um, the real world? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. So you just mentioned your work uh, was well received, but but of course you're not the only writer in Bosnia. What's the situation of yeah other queer authors or or queer people in general? About queer authors, I think uh, that, yeah, I, I mentioned we really now have our own place in the literary scene, mm -hmm. but you mentioned the real life is something else. Even I can say there are some good uh, improvements also in, in real life because uh, now we have, for example, uh, in Sarajevo, Pride every year. It's in the uh, last couple of years before that we didn't have anything. Yeah, of course, there are many opponents. There is also in this public space a lot of haters. But, uh, you know, you, need, you, you are here, you live here, and you need to fight somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, definitely I'm not the, the only uh, queer author in Bosnia. They are uh, now, with the newer generation, they are even more and more of queer authors, but I would also like to mention my really good colleague, and she's a really great writer, Lamia Begovic. So, yeah, uh, but you know, here also in Berlin, we, we frequently speak about situation in, in countries of former Yugoslavia, and uh, people are often ask me, how is it, what is this happening? And, you know, from my uh, personal perspective, you always have your own bubble 
of people, mm -hmm. of interest, of so you know you find your way t to live and uh, to be somehow also protected and secure. But uh, generally speaking, in uh, our society there are so many big problems, not just including minorities. Mm -hmm. There are so big uh, political questions also today, so yeah, the, the situation is not really well, it's not well at all. But, you know, I live there and I live for many, many years there. there and uh, when you are there, you need to find your own way. And I think that I somehow have found it and also some found some, I, I can call them my people. So, yeah, it has its, its uh, good and bad sides. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, your first book in German, Nennt mich Esteban, was um, very well received in the German-speaking countries by critics and readers alike. And uh, it's usually quite hard for authors from Southeast Europe to, to get translated into other languages because uh, most of them don't have literary agents. Uh, but I read that your um, translator, Marie Alpermann, basically played, played the part of, of being your agents trying to get you published in in germany is that is that correct yes definitely and marie she's a really great translator and actually um, all what happened with the the esteban and now what is happening with this book Denk der die stadt uh, i can thank to her because she didn't just translate the books she she's also trying in any possible way to promote it in, in German-speaking countries. And actually we met also on one book fair, it was in Leipzig, uh, before Corona, I don't, I, I don't know, 2018 or 19. And I had this uh, small event on, this, on Traduki, mm -hmm. uh, organized by Traduki, and she approached me and, you know, she was, uh, yeah, I think in that time she was still a student. And she told me that she read some of my stories and that she would love to translate it into German and maybe possibly to try to find the publisher. And uh, yeah, of course, uh, I said that, that she can do it. Uh, I'll be happy if she can uh, succeed in any, if in any of that. But <laughs> actually, I didn't have any expe expectation because, you know, you, you mentioned I don't have age and and I know how many, how it's hard to be published in, in, in foreign language. But actually it uh, worked. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it was all thanks to her effort. She translated all the stories from the book and she was the one who had found the publisher, Etta Ferlag. That's how I met also Petya Lund. She's the founder of the publishing house. And uh, yeah, it was really, really nice and successful story, I think. But uh, I, I just want to mention it once again. It was all <laughs> because of Marie took uh, her own effort to publish and to promote my books into German-speaking countries, yeah. So the, the first German book, Nett mich Estepan, was very much influenced by your own life and experiences. Denk dir die Stadt now has a different focus, a different agenda, so to say. We get to know many perspectives, find out about lots of figures and, and, and circumstances. How did this come about? Was it a conscious decision to yeah, turn, turn away from, from autobiographical writing? Uh, yes, Nennt mich Esteban, it's not my first book, mm -hmm. but it was uh, my, my uh, till now... Uh, best known book and uh, the, it was the first time that I I was writing uh, about uh, my life so it's it really is out uh, it's um, autobiographical and after that book uh, he, somehow the book succeed uh, I didn't expect many things that followed after that but uh, yeah it turned out that Many people like the book, and I also got translation in, into some other languages like uh, Polish or Italian and English. And maybe many people uh, expected that I will follow that track, you know, that I will mm -hmm. uh, keep on with my own life and experience. And 
probably in the future I will do it also. But after that book and that kind of success, I really needed to try something else. Mm -hmm. you know, I wanted to uh, write some, something different. And that's how all stories from this book, Dengria Rishtat, come up. Uh, but there is also uh, me in this book because I'm, again, writing about all the themes and all the problems I found very, from one side, painful, from, from the other side, important from my own society. So yes, there are different stories about many kinds of people, but there are still the topics about, you know, uh, war and post-war Bosnia and uh, minorities in our society. And there are also stories about older people which are not well represented and not frequently represented mm -hmm. in our uh, literature. So yeah, it's different book, but somehow it's still <laughs> me. Mm -hmm. Lots of these characters have to face difficult issues and problems. For the most part, the book talks about very serious, dark topics like loss, war, death, alcoholism, illness, What keeps drawing you back to these topics? A few days ago, I spoke to my really good uh, friend and colleague. She's also a writer. Uh, my really cro close friend, Senka Maric. Her uh, novel was also published here in Germany, in Eta mm -hmm. Verlag. And we were talking about, you know, writing in gen general. And then we somehow agreed that we all write, at least we should write about things that we somehow know things that are uh, uh, intriguing us or things that are familiar with us or that we experience them and something like that. And all those topics um, I, I mentioned from one side, you can find it many di diversity in these stories, but they are always saying about um, problems and topics that I'm involved in in my society, in my life, and there are also all of those topics are something that are really uh, worrying me or that I um, sympathize with or something like that. And because these stories are so diverse and you just mentioned you try to also talk about older people, um, youth also plays a big part in, in the book, so both young and old. Was there a plan to kind of represent a broad spectrum of Bosnian society? After I finished uh, Esteban, I keep on writing uh, short stories. And at the moment I was writing them, I, I actually didn't have this kind of bigger picture like that they all will uh, be in one book. It's something that came much later. I just felt the urge to write about some of those stories. For example, when I was in Vienna, I had this idea about this story, Mozart against Mozart, and all the others. They, they were really... Um, I was writing them separately. And then in one point, after maybe 10 stories, I had... Uh, then I started to think about maybe they all belong to one book. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I also met uh, my publisher from Serbia, uh, Ljubica Pupezin. Uh, she's a founder and editor in uh, publishing house Strik. And she offered me to publish something in her publishing house. And I told her about those s short stories and sent them to her. And that's how we had this idea of a uh, new book of short stories. So uh, I just I wanted to say that uh, when I'm writing a story, it's not that I uh, at the beginning have the, this whole plan, what is going to happen next. If I have an urge to write about something, I do it. And you know, always you need time uh, in the process of writing and the idea for the book came Uh, much later, but yeah, uh, in some point I realized that all those stories can be in one book, that they somehow belong together. Mm 
mm-hmm. but it wasn't some kind of a concept that, that I chose, you know, these topics and told myself, now you need to write about this, this, this and this. Mm-hmm. Uh, it came more spontaneously. So that's the process also. When I was ri- uh, r- writing Esteban, first uh, I wrote the, the last story in the book, then the first one, and while I was writing them, I, I had no idea that it is going to be a book. Mm-hmm. I just, oh, uh, I'm repeating myself, but I really uh, felt the urge to write them, and the idea about the book came after that. What was the uh, first story you wrote in this collection? Uh, in this collection, uh, 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 uh. I think the first story was Mozart against Mozart, because I mentioned uh, I wrote it in 2016, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, but I just wrote that story and with no idea <laughs> what <laughs> what will follow, and then a uh, few years after that, I realized that also that story should be in this book. But the uh, idea of the book I had when I had the first and the, again last story in the book. First is Stajovo Unama and the last one is, uh, yeah, it's the titled mm-hmm. book, uh, it's Denk dir die Stadt. But chronologically speaking, the first story from this book was Mozart against Mozart and it's in Vienna. <laughs> Reading this story, I had the feeling that you have a very deep insight in the in the situation here in, in Vienna. Is it because you walk around with eyes open and talk to a lot of people? Is there um, lots of research involved? There are some researches, but uh, you know also, I mentioned uh, when you asked me uh, about my time here in Berlin, uh, I also, when I come to Vienna, I, I meet many people because many people from my country and from the former Yugoslavian countries now live in Vienna. And uh, somehow I know the situations, we all know. And um, we know it, every beginning is really hard. So uh, I want to say that um, some things I already knew, but actually it was that kind of um, coincidence that one day uh, I was walking through the town and I really met those men. At the beginning they approached me with these flyers, you know, and everything, and actually I wasn't aware uh, that they are from my region. And they, one of them asked me where, where I'm from, and when I said Sarajevo, he started to talk in my language and then I realized all these young men they are all from former Yugoslavia or Albania and and somehow you know especially because it's a story also about Mozart that scene kept with me you know and then I realized that I really need to write story about these young men. So you start writing stories they get more and more and you realize them somehow they fit together There's um, 16 stories in your book. How do you arrange your material? I have always some kind uh, of help with this, I can say, dramaturgy of mm-hmm. the book. My closest friends in Sarajevo uh, are play writers, and they, they all they finished the Academy of Performing Arts, and they are all, all of them are dramaturgists. So uh, in Esteban, actually, we, I, I sat with two of them and somehow we arrange the place each story will take in the book. And for this uh, second one, I also consulted them, but I worked with my editor and uh, I mentioned her and the owner of this um, publishing house Strik, Ljubica Pupezin, and it was uh, our decision we both agreed which uh, story will take which part in the book. And the first thing we knew, uh, it was completely clear, that this uh, first story in the book, Štaja Vunama, it needs to open the book. And uh, the last one, Denk dir die Stadt, it's the ending story. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Why does the, the first one need to, need to open it? You know, because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, there are so many topics in this story, including our bigger social situation and political situation in Bosnia. It's a story uh, somehow linked to the war. 
and uh, post-war Bosnia, but also be the topic of um, people who left the country and try to <clears throat> start from the beginning in some other country uh, uh, starting a new life. And also there is this uh, topic of mental health, which is really neglected in our society, although we really have uh, this problem that many, many people are still struggling with the traumas caused by the war. So, yeah, we somehow agreed that it would be a really good thing that that uh, story opened the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the book ends with your story, Denkte die Stadt, also the title of your book. And for me, this was actually a good end for the collection because it also deals with serious issues, but there's also so much hope to it in terms of the power of imagination or the power of the connection between two people. Hope in times of desperation, maybe. Yes, yes. I really tried to also write about some, or actually to put some optimism in the book, and I decided that it has to be in that particular story. When I arranged this uh, collaboration with the publishing house Trick, uh, before uh, Ljubica Pupezin even read the story, I told her, you know, I think that this book should be called uh, Denk dir die Stadt. In original, it's a little bit different. The name is Požuri izmisli grad. And she was like, uh, I don't know, was it a really good title for the book? And then she read the story and right away she, she wrote me email and said, yes, the book <laughs> should be named by this story. And uh, because, yeah, that's also... Uh, Somehow it's, uh, it's a hard topic, it's about that, but also it brings some light at the end. Because I think uh, that in our society or our societies, if I'm talking about former Yugoslavia, is really, in this point, uh, is really uh, important to open and to give some perspective about better life and even if maybe I can say a better world for all those people. And I think that we cannot completely lose that maybe utopical but really important part of our being, our imagination, and uh, yeah, we cannot uh, completely lose the hope. Mm -hmm. The book is dealing with very serious issues, and you already mentioned the, the lightness, and I think there is a lot of lightness to, to your book, not only to the last story. And I was, I kept asking myself, where does this lightness come from? It, it's kind of hard to explain. Uh, so I was just wondering how you achieve it. it, it is it because there's a certain humor to the stories? Is it... Uh, because you avoid big gestures or b big, strong metaphors? Um, is it because of the empathy in your writing? How do, how do you see this? How, uh, what was your approach, especially when dealing with these uh, s severe struggles? Uh, mostly I'm really writing about uh, hard topics. But one thing that I always I'm counting on is a humor, because uh, it also represents our societies and people, uh, without humor we couldn't be able to bury many things, but there is always a humor and I'm trying to use it as much as I can. Of course, um, it depends of any story. And uh, yeah, definitely uh, in all those stories and all those um, people's destinies, I, I can say, uh, yeah, there is always a hope that things and uh, lives could or sh even should be better. Without it, uh, what would be a point, you know? So it uh, doesn't matter how um, stories are about really uh, painful and hard topics, but uh, there is always that, that kind of hope that uh, we should go on and we should be... Um, not just hoping, but also trying to achieve a better life because people in, in my country, people in former Yugoslavia countries, they really deserve a better life. And that's the fact. 
and I'm trying never to lose that from my mind when I'm writing those stories. Okay, uh, I don't want to avoid all the problems. Actually, I'm really trying to deal with mm-hmm. all the problems we have. <laughs> yeah. But also, uh, I, I just want to keep in mind that, okay, that's what happened. That's what we are living now. But all of us, we need also to fight for a better life because we deserve, after all, the better life. And do the, do the issues you're dealing with determine the form and structure of a work that consists of lots of uh, little pieces, short stories, miniatures? How come you focus on, on short stories? Do, do you find the short story? Does the short story find you? Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's always the question. Actually, uh, you, you also uh, mentioned it when you, when you were talking about my literary work. Actually, I'm also writing a theater plays. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm trying with it. Uh, I have four till now. I, I cannot say how much success, su- successful they are, but I have also the urge to write for theater. And uh, now I'm also trying to write a novel. It's uh, yeah, but novel, you know, it always it, it always take time, so it's still in the process. But I started with a short story. Somehow, in this literary sense, I can say that short story is my first love. Many of my colleagues, they started with poems, mm-hmm. and I know that's uh, I think more uh, common entrance into a literature world, world is to start with uh, poems, but I, I had never wrote a poem. Actually, now in this book, there is one short story that is much like a poem, mm-hmm. but actually I started with the short stories because it suits me somehow. And I think that I will never stop uh, writing them because at the market, at the moment, they are not so popular mm-hmm. because many people are telling me, okay, great with the short stories, but you need to write a novel. Okay, I'm trying. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I also, I, I would love to have a novel, but I don't consider short story less important. Many times when I had the idea about something, at the beginning, I always have this urge to from something to make a short story. So that's why, despite all the <laughs> things in the market today, I think that I will never give up of uh, writing short stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm usually surprised talking to other authors, finding out that uh, they started with poetry because you don't really hear about it. I mean, it, it has a hard time being published just to like uh, uh, short stories. You usually find it in uh, magazines online or, or in print. But uh, yeah, lots of Authors that are known for their novels are also uh, poets. Uh. <laughs> yes, also my uh, close friend, I mentioned her, Senka Maric. She's a great novelist, definitely. But she started, and she started to, to, to write uh, uh, poems when she was a child. It was, uh, yeah, her first voice in, in literature. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, for many years, uh, it was also unpopular in former Yugoslavia countries because nobody wanted to to publish poetry like poetry. Nobody reads poetry. Who reads poetry? (laughs) But I think also in the the last few years, things are changed completely. Uh, With this younger generation, and especially with female authors, and now poetry uh, in our region is uh, really popular. And uh, yeah, they, they somehow approve that people want to read poetry, you know. So, yeah. Maybe it's the question also about short stories. Maybe they are unpopular at the moment. It doesn't mean that in 10 years the situation <laughs> will be the same. Yeah. Well, we, we, we hope so. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> are there specific uh, authors or traditions that are uh, important to you con- concerning the short stories? Is it Because you see, when talking to people from Southeastern Europe, people usually expect, oh, tell me this. Croatian or Bosnian author that I've never heard of before, but lots of, especially the younger generation, they also read the American <laughs> short stories. Uh, because American uh, short stories are most popular in the world and they, they really had so strong tradition. I was shocked when 
people now I have also a publisher in US and I'm really thankful for that but when when they were uh, when they told me that even in America it's not popular anymore because uh, yeah it, for me it's hard to imagine because re they really had a strong strong tra tradition of short stories mm -hmm. so uh, yeah well, okay uh, at this moment things are like that but uh, uh, considering my own short stories I, I uh, I had many influences. It was uh, American short stories, short story tradition, but also in my own region, many of, uh, for me, important authors, male and female, they also wrote uh, short stories. Maybe they are not well known, and maybe even not translated into other languages, mm -hmm. but somehow I have found them really, really um, important, and they had their influences on me and my writing. So we talked about the arrangement or the, oh my God, how do you pronounce dramaturgy? In yeah, yeah, I don't know, is it the correct uh, pronunciation in English, dramaturgy yeah, yeah. of the book, but yeah, dramaturgia. Yeah. <laughs> so we talked about this already. I'll just leave this in, I won't cut mm -hmm. it out. <laughs> we talked about the first story, the last story, but we didn't really talk about what holds these uh, stories together because uh, you mentioned at one point you realized that there is a connection. There, There is something like a, maybe not so much like a main topic or theme in the singular, but still... Mm, Still something. For for me, it was probably some kind of longing or yearning, which is found in all, all of these stories. Mm -hmm. I can agree. Uh, <laughs> longing is a really big part in each of the stories. But I also uh, think it's my opinion. I don't know uh, the readers, uh, would they agree with me? But I think that main link in all those stories is topic of loss because i think in every story there is some kind of loss that the uh, characters are dealing with and um, yeah it also came from from my society and our situations that many many people are somehow um, still uh, fighting with some kind of losses and there were many losses in our recent past. I think that we could say that uh, different ki kind of losses are also uh, something that uh, bounds all those stories. And I realized that something that can be found in almost every story of the book are dreams. There's mm -hmm. a lot of there's a lot of dreaming dreaming dream of their lost ones um, of a better life of of the past about things they did do or did not do. Can you elaborate on this about the meaning of the dream for your for your stories? Definitely, and uh, the dreams are important in many of the stories, and that's something that we already uh, discussed uh, about. Uh, the lives we have and the lives we are longing for, we are uh, hoping for, or, or, or whatever. Uh, yes, uh, um, I cannot say that the dreams are the main connection, but they are really important for many of those stories. And um, coming back to the title again, I, th I think... It's not only a good title because it, it deals with uh, imagination and um, hoping for the better. Um, it also, of course, has the city in it. And the city itself plays an important part in the book. Not only Sarajevo, also Vienna, also other places. What role does this urban life in general play in the book? How is How do you write the city? Mm -hmm. <laughs> a city is almost a character in mm -hmm. my stories and it was also in Esteban yeah and mostly okay I also I try to write about some other cities uh, but the main <laughs> city I'm writing uh, about uh, is Sarajevo because almost all my life I'm in Sarajevo yeah and uh, people will always say that uh, city are the people who live in this city. But I think that the city also has its own past. Sarajevo has also really different periods. 
and many many things happened mm -hmm. in that city. Uh, so when I'm thinking about Sarajevo, I'm also thinking about different Sarajevo from uh, one to another time, and I'm really interested in past of the city. So um, maybe after these many years of living, uh, I, I can even say that my connection with Sarajevo is m my strongest connection in the life, even um, bigger and stronger than connection to some other people. So um, I'm not trying to avoid it. And there is also one small city that I'm uh, attached to. It's in uh, Serbia, in Vojvodina. It's Shid. It's so small town, almost like village. So uh, uh, from time to time I, I want and try to write uh, about that place, but probably because most of my life is connected to Sarajevo, that's why Sarajevo is, is so uh, present in my stories. Mm -hmm. And you also quote one of the most famous German Großstadtromane. And I was quite, quite surprised because you, you quote Alfred Döblin and uh, you also quote Hilde Domin in your stories. How, how did this come about? What do you read? Do you know lots of uh, German literature? Yeah. My generation, because I'm 42 years old and I was born in Yugoslavia and lived 12 years in that country and after that, I live in Bosnia, but uh, in my generation, even through our school system, uh, when we are talking about literature, uh, we were mostly influenced by Russian and German literature. And some of uh, my role models, models I discover through uh, my education and the others were my own, uh, I can say, researches, and the Berlin Alexander Platz is one of my favorite books. And when I came to Berlin first time, I, uh, the first thing I needed to see is to go to Berlin Alexanderplatz. Mm -hmm. And there is this small quote. I, I, it will stay with me all my life because it's so beautiful. And about Hilde Domin, I didn't um, uh, knew about uh, Hilde Domin at all. And uh, just by chance, it was also, I think, book fair in Belgrade. I saw this small book of poetry, and it was the first translation that traduced it uh, with our countries from German language into it was into Serbian. And I bought the book, and I was completely amused by this poetry. And that's why I quote also her in one uh, story. And maybe yeah, it it, it became um, really important to me because nobody told me about her. I didn't get to uh, her poetry through any kind of like education or nobody from the the colleagues on the scene told me. I just discovered her <laughs> on my own and it became really important for me. So, yeah, I have really different uh, role models and yeah, also in Esteban there, there is Kafka. <laughs> And many others also, like uh, Albert Camus and the, the others, Elizabeth Bishop. So I never try to somehow to hide who are mo my role models, models are and how much they influenced my work. So I, I really like those small quotations at the beginning of the stories, just to somehow, to even, I can say, to pay a tribute to them. Yeah, and we have to be we have to be nice. There's a third author you're quoting that is uh, Bruno Schulz. Yes, is. yes, of course, <laughs> Bruno Schulz. Yeah, yeah. Also, I, I mentioned uh, German literature, Russian literature, and also a former Yugoslavian uh, literary scene was really, really much influenced by Polish literature, and it's still today. Uh, I can openly say, yeah, I, I was really uh, so happy, and I'm really. Uh, much influenced by and amused by uh, literature of Olga Tokarczuk. And there are also many others, but for example, because we are always somehow following what is happening in uh, Polish literature. I was wondering for some time how to end our conversation, and there is 
one topic that I think is, is, is very fitting, I think be, also because I was looking at your Instagram and you find a lot of cats uh, on mm. your Instagram. <laughs> I want to talk about animals too uh, at the end of this um, talk. Both of your books translated into German have birds on the cover. And I think this is no surprise because animals play such an important part in, in your work. There's cats and dogs. There's There's a starving bear in one of the stories. There are birds that get killed in both of your books, I think, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because they have to serve for a meal or because they get killed by accident by a plane or because they didn't notice an, an office building made of glass. Um, can you speak about what interests you about animals in general and what meaning they have for your stories? Uh, at first, I, I need to say that I'm an animal person, definitely. Uh, <laughs> I really love animals. And uh, yeah, people all, always, when you say you, you, you like animals, they ask you, cats or dogs? I'm into also cats, dogs, birds, <laughs> everything. And in my life, they bring me so much joy. When you mention my Instagram profile, actually, it's one cat. It's my okay. cat. Her name is Kiki. <laughs> and I always want to, uh, uh, I'm telling people that she's soul of my soul. Yeah, she's really, really uh, so important for me. And suffering of the animals is something that uh, really always strikes me. And uh, in many stories, I always, I'm trying to, to link the suffering between animals and people. I think that Sometimes through the suffering of the animal, you also can show how many people are suffering or how, how society is wrong in, in that point. So, yes, that is something that's really important for me. Uh, I really love animals and that's how they find their way to my stories. So there will be, there will be more book covers um, yeah, but now show, it was funny, us. funny situation <laughs> because uh, especially for this uh, German edition and translations of my book, at the first one it's the owl and a book cover, and the second one is a pigeon. And now uh, I'm in process of um, publishing my uh, uh, theater plays in uh, in Serbia for this. Uh, publishing house Strick, and they asked me at the beginning, uh, we don't have a, a cover yet, but they asked me what would I want for mm -hmm. the cover, and then I told them, okay, we can try everything, but please make a pose with the birds, <laughs> because, okay, it's, it's so fine, we, we can now try with something else. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so we're looking forward to, to new material with or without birds and I'm, uh, thank you so much for, for talking to me today uh, thank you so much for inviting me I really enjoy the conversations I'm apologizing if my English is not uh, so good <laughs> but you know that's always the question uh, when you you always can you know, speak the best at your own language and when you are speaking in any other it's some kind of simplification and maybe some uh, but we talked about some serious and complicated things but i think that uh, somehow people will understand and that we succeed <laughs> in this conversation <laughs> i think they will thank you once again mm -hmm.